Hey folks, I'm Patrick Franci, creator and host of this show, The Everyday Millionaire, where seemingly ordinary individuals achieve extraordinary results and they share their stories, their journeys, their strategies with you today. And when it comes to extraordinary, my guest today, Brett Kessler, is no exception. He is going to share with you a strategy that has made thousands of people millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever it is for you using his money magnifier system. The money magnifier is a proven strategy and you're going to find why Brent is so excited and passionate about this particular strategy. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to please like, smash that subscribe button, Hit the comments and give us some feedback on what you like about the show, even what you don't like about the show. We're going to get those algorithms fired up and grow this channel. I can assure you today, listening to Brent, you will see the possibilities of being that everyday millionaire using the strategies that he so passionately describes today. Listen in, enjoy. Let's get this show started. Hey, folks, welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Podcast. I'm joined today by Brent Kessler. Brent, thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me, Patrick. Excited to be here. Now, you are the principal founder of the Money Multiplier, and that is your company, that is your brand. And that's what we're here to talk about. I like the conversation anytime about multiplying money, I think that's cool. Yeah, no, actually, that, yeah, right. It's so like a pretty cool name. And I'll tell you how we came up with the name. You know, my wife and I were in South Carolina and we were driving and trying to come up with the name, you know, and with because everything you have to do is with the word money. So M, we were trying to get the M in there, right? So the money multiplier. And I think it was my wife that actually came up with the name. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. That'll stick, you know? And sure enough, it does. Because anyway, like even my email address is brent at the money multiplier.com. So everybody, so, so about every time I give my email address, they're like, what? The money multiplier? Hey, I want to do that. Can you <laughs> show me how to do that? And then and then all I do is I take out my cell phone and it says the money multiplier. And on the bottom of it, it has my name and it says the money coach. And it also has the website on it. But there's also a QR code. And I'll say, well, here you go. Go ahead and scan this QR code. And that'll ah, tell you what I do. That's a cool idea. That's a cool yeah. idea. Now, we haven't even started the conversation yet. And I like that idea. So yeah. the QR code on the back of the phone, I mean, there's lots of technology, but I mean, that's a cool idea. Let's face it. So did you and just again, Patrick, that was my wife's idea. So <laughs> I, I mean, I'm married up, right? So keeper, again, keeper. <laughs> I've only been talking to you for 90 seconds and already given my wife two compliments. So who knows how many there are to come? <laughs> You're getting points all over the place. Well, she's a keeper, no doubt about that. So, you know, Aside from that kind of uh, intro, Brent, when people ask you, what do you do? Give us a little bit of insights and how do you answer that question these days? Yeah, absolutely. When someone asks me, you know, what my job is or, or to, just, just to tell them about, you know, just my stuff, I say the thing that I do is I help people build, keep and create wealth through the debts and expenses that you already have, right? And they're like, what? Build wealth through your expenses. That's right. So the thing that we do is all pay with, okay, stuff with money. So for example, you know, I have this $20 bill here. And if I want to go buy something, it could be a car, a house, a boat, a bicycle, a cell phone, a computer. It doesn't matter what it is. I have to use this money. I have to give this money to someone else. And in exchange, they give me the product or service that I just bought. So really, that's OK. That is what money is. Right. So the definition of money is it's nothing more than a means of exchange, because that's what we do. We exchange money all day for products and services. Mm -hmm. So I help show people how they can keep all that money in their family and also buy the things that they're buying in life anyway. So essentially, the thing that we're doing, Patrick, is we're recycling and recapturing all of the dollars that would have ordinarily going out to other people because that money can come back to us through this concept called the infinite banking concept. Okay. So why don't you, if you can walk us through a scenario of where, how this 
program or this thought process, whatever you want to call it, the system. Yeah. Uh, walk us through a example, perhaps, of what that might look like in somebody's day to day life. Got it. Well, anyway, the first thing I want to say is that, um, it, it, again, so like all the knowledge I have on this subject was really driven by this book right here. It's called Becoming Your Own Banker. And a guy named R. Nelson Nash, he wrote that book. And mm -hmm. actually, back in March of 2019, so almost five years ago now, pretty close, um, actually, is uh, back when Nelson was age 87, he passed away. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this book changed my financial life. It, it completely turned my financial life around. So Nelson, he was my mentor. So all of my teachings that I share now, for the last 12 years, I've been teaching this concept since 2012, um, is all accredited to him and his teachings. But anyway, so the infinite banking concept or becoming your own banker, again, I mean, it's been a concept that's been around for years. As a matter of fact, like, let's say you go out and do research on the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays, right? So they all understood how to keep and create wealth inside of their own family, right? So, mm -hmm. and again, that's been for over 200 years. And if you think about it, our tax code has only been here in the state since 1913, right? So this concept was going on well before you know, the tax code. So just to give you an example, and again, um, Patrick, and I know what you're going to, um, okay, go over this, um, okay, as far as a bit later, or, or you're going to share it in the notes, but but actually just like on my website, themoneymultiplier.com. So like I have this presentation that people can go and view and it's like 90 minutes long. It's an hour and a half long. And I have all of my examples and spreadsheets and all of that. But to give you a high level just for our call today, the mm -hmm. thing that I do in that presentation is I show people how to get all the money back on all the cars that they're ever going to buy, drive and own in their life. Now, I tell people that and they say, what? I'm going to get the money back for my cars that I buy. And I and again, they're kind of like, what? How do you do that? Right. Well, again, OK, the concept is about like as far as you spending money and not only do you get the product or service, but now you're able to get those dollars back. And so the way we do it through this concept is that. OK, the thing we do is we put money into a specifically designed, a specially engineered whole life insurance policy that pays dividends. Now, I know what just happened there, Patrick. I said the word whole life insurance and we <laughs> lost half of the viewers. I get it. It happens all the time. But let me be clear. This is not any type of life insurance policy. This is not the type of policy that you can go and buy from your brother-in-law that sells life insurance, right? Because we all have a brother-in-law that sells life insurance. No, this is a specifically designed, a specially engineered whole life policy that is in a mutual company that pays dividends and has high immediate cash value. I'm going to say that one more time high immediate cash value. So basically what that means is that, okay, so when you put money into the policy, okay, immediately, and my definition of immediately is within the first 30 days, the thing you're going to do is you're going to start borrowing from that policy to pay your debts and your expenses, that you, to pay your debts and expenses just that you already have. Also, the products or your investments or anything that you're doing with money, the thing you want to do is run the money through the policy first. And just when you do that, you're able to keep that money in the family. There's no money being leaked out to other people. Now, I just want to tell you, OK, Patrick, especially because, you know, um, as far as as we were just introducing ourselves to each other earlier on the call, you told me that you're in Canada. This concept works even better in Canada than it does in the U.S. I mean, it works great in the United States, but mm -hmm. in Canada, it even works better. I've even thought about a couple of times, you know, because down here in the States, we get all 
like frustrated with, you know, as far as the stuff that's going on in the economy and the politics and all that crap. And I've even told my wife a couple of times, I said, honey, maybe we should move to Canada. <laughs> the bank works just as good, if not better in Canada. As a matter of fact, I have a Canadian counterpart because I personally can't write business in Canada, mm -hmm. but I have a Canadian counterpart that is just the go-to rock star of this. And actually he's located up in, in, in uh, he's located up in Calgary and Edmonton. So mm -hmm. for all your Canadian listeners out and there. Calgary and Edmonton's my backyard too. So I born and raised in Edmonton, uh, heading to Calgary in a week from now, less than a week from now. So I'm back and forth all the time into the province of Alberta. So that's cool. You never know where this could go. So I love well, this conversation. Well, so hey, far. Patrick, I'll tell you my it. story about Edmonton. You know, I, I right? Like I have a, like a colleague, okay, up there. And he, uh, um, so again, the thing he does every now and then is the thing he does and invites me to come up there to speak. And so like, I'll tell you how good of a friend he is. He invited me to Edmonton to speak to a group in the month of February. Oh, nice. Now, yeah. Now, I had never been to Edmonton before, you know, and That's I wasn't fantastic. thinking much of it, but I got on the plane and I flew up there yeah. and keep in mind, um, Patrick, so that I live in Florida. Okay. <laughs> I live in Florida. So he invited me to Edmonton in February. I got yeah. off the plane and yeah. I said, Jason, I thought you were a friend of mine. You are yeah. no friend at all. Yeah, there's a hundred degree swing right there. <laughs> 80 to minus 25. There you go. <laughs> That's great. So do you want to give a shout out for your friend? Oh, yeah. So uh, Jason Lowe. Yeah. Um, okay, his name is Jason Lowe. We call him J Lo, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. The dancer singer J Lo. But yeah, so like Jason Lowe, his company is called Ascendant Financial. Ascendant Financial, and he has offices in Edmonton and Calgary. His, cool. sorry, the primary is in Edmonton. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so walk me through this scenario. So I'm I'm buying a whole life pro policy, I'm putting money into that. Then I'm borrowing against the whole life policy. I'm being paid dividends. And that's where I got to. And then I'll let you finish the rest of that story. Yeah. So the thing that you do is decide how much dollars you want to put in the policy. You see, I never, ever tell clients how much to put in. I have over 9,000 clients in every state of the country. I never, ever tell anybody to how much to put in to the policy. So it's up to you. You know, I have people to put in $150 a month and I have people to put in $540,000 a month into the policy. So I just tell people, pick a number in between there, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that you do is you put money into the policy. So you're paying premium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know just when we think of a policy, OK, um, OK, like especially a life insurance policy, the thing we're thinking of it as death benefit. Well, this is not about death benefit at all. Yes, there is death benefit on the policy. But purposely, Patrick, what we do is try to keep the death benefit as low as possible in the beginning stages of the policy. And that way it's going to increase the cash value because a person is not going to need their death benefit early on. OK, as far as in the policy, unless something, God forbid, a catastrophe happens, because if the insurance company thought just that you were going to die early, they would never issue you the policy. So what mm. we're doing is we are solving the need for finance and cash. And as long as I solve your need for finance and cash, you'll have more death benefit than you can ever imagine. So the thing we do is we put money into the policy and we pay premium. Now, the premium, like I said, is your choice. The person can pay premium either like quarterly, monthly, twice a year, annually. They can always change the mode of how they pay it. They can also always reduce the premium by at least 60 percent or even greater. And the thing you can do is start using money immediately. And like I said earlier, within the first month, within the first 30 days. Now, the thing that people do is they'll put money into the policy and they'll use their cash value 
to buy their things that they're buying in life anyway. Products, services, investments, debts, expenses. It doesn't matter what you use the money for. There's no restrictions. As a matter of fact, the insurance company will never, never ask you why you are taking a policy loan. And they never ask you if you plan on paying that loan back because the insurance company does not care. And here's why. Because there's two parts of the policy. There's the cash value and there's the death benefit. Well, the death benefit is always greater than the cash value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of us are guaranteed to die past <laughs> graduate. Right. So whichever word that you want to use. It's not an if it's a when we all have an expiration date. We just don't know when that is. So the insurance company can never lose because the death benefit is always higher than the cash value. So if you pass away and you have a loan on the policy, all that's going to happen is the death benefit is going to pay off any outstanding loan mm -hmm. and your beneficiaries will get the remainder tax free. So essentially, Patrick, what we're doing is we are using a portion of our death benefit while we are living instead of us just leaving all the death benefit to our family. And, OK, so the way we start the policy is, is um, again, the thing you have to do is decide the premium amount that you want to put in. And even if you wanted to start a policy, let's say your listeners are like, man, I got to start one of those policies. Even if you want to do it, it doesn't mean that you're able to do it because you mm -hmm. have to get approved for the policy. In other words, the insurance company has to make sure you look as good on the inside as you do on the outside. So it generally takes about a month to six weeks OK, to get your policy approved. And then once you get the policy approved, now the policy is delivered to you. And now what you review it, you go through it, make sure it says everything I'm telling you it's going to say. And if all looks good, you sign it and send it in. And now your policy is in force. Now, once your policy is in force, what you're going to do is start borrowing borrowing dollars. Now, keep in mind, Patrick, that we are not borrowing from our own policy. No, we're actually going to put our policy up for collateral and we're taking a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. So that is a great thing because in sense, our money is staying inside of the policy. So it's growing and compounding at a guaranteed tax-free growth rate with dividends. Tax-free growth with dividends. So essentially the thing you're doing, Patrick, is you're using your money and it's continuing to grow. So it's uninterrupted compound <laughs> interest. Now, if you play honest banker with yourself, which you should, Anytime you borrow from your policy, what you should do is pay yourself back with interest. It's not necessary. It's not required. But, but however, the thing I teach people to do is I teach you to treat your money the same way you would treat a bank's money. For example, so let's say that if you go out to a bank and borrow money to buy a house or a car, well, if you do that, then you're expected to pay the bank back with interest. And we all do it and we never question it, right? We borrow money from a bank and pay them back with interest. So isn't it a good idea that if we borrow from ourselves, we should pay ourselves back with interest? It's a great idea, but do we ever do it? No, we never do it. As a matter of fact, most people, when they borrow money from themselves or take money, I shouldn't even use the word borrow, all you do is you take money out of your bank account or your checking account, savings account, wherever it is. You go buy all of the mm -hmm. crap that you want to buy and you never have a system to pay yourself back with interest, much less the principal. So the thing we teach is for you to treat your money the same way you treat a bank's money. So now what we're going to do, Patrick, is all we're doing in this whole process is we're just adding one step in our financial life. And the example that I give in my presentation is the thing we're going to do is we're going to buy a car. 
So basically, I go over in my presentation how you put money into the policy, and then I have a $25,000 car as an example. So now the thing we do is we go borrow from the policy. But remember, we're not really borrowing from the policy. We're putting our policy up for collateral, borrowing from the general fund. And now we're going to borrow that $25,000 and we're going to pay ourselves back with interest. And the example that I use is $500 a month or $6,000 per year for five years. So we borrow $25,000, pay back $30,000. Now, it's not necessary to do that, but I'm trying to get you in the mindset to treat your money the same way you would treat a bank's money. The only difference is, is that it's your money. It's your money because you're under control. Because see, here's how banking works. So like, and, and it probably works the same way in Canada that it does in the U.S. So there's this thing that we call fractional reserve banking. So all of us do what? We all put our money into a conventional bank, not our own bank. So we put it in somebody else's bank, like a Wells Fargo, a U.S. bank, a Chase bank, a BMO bank, right? All the different banks that you know the name of, and you probably have a list of them up in Canada as well. So the thing we do is put our money in there and we write checks against that to buy the things that we want in life anyway. Now, a bank can loan eight, 10, $12 for every dollar that they have on hand, which is fractional reserve banking. So a bank actually loans money out of thin air. A bank doesn't have <laughs> all the money that they have lent out. As a matter of fact, if everybody in the country or the world or whatever, if we all went to the bank on the same day to get our money out, it'd be a meltdown. We would have <laughs> been probably 20 cents on every dollar because yeah. it's physically not there. Mm -hmm. We'll see. And then also you got to keep in mind, Patrick, is when you borrow money from a bank, who are you making rich? Not yourself. You're mm -hmm. making profit holders and the stockholders and the shareholders of the bank rich, right? Mm -hmm. Because anyway, they're making the profits and the dividends on your money. Well, compared to if you put your money into a whole life policy in a mutual insurance company that pays dividends, the key word I just said there, Patrick, was mutual. And what mutual means is that you are the owner of the policy contract, not the company, but you own the policy contract and you get first right of your money. So anytime you want your money, no matter where the insurance company may have it distributed to, you go knocking on the door and they have to give you your money. It is a mutual company, which means there are no profit holders and shareholders. You you own the contract. So you are making the profits and the dividends. And the word you used earlier was dividends. Now, Patrick, even though that in a policy, even though that like the dividends are not guaranteed, all the companies in the United States have been paying dividends for over 123 consecutive years without fail. Now, I can't speak to Canada because I don't know. I'm not knowledgeable on, on the dividend structure in Canada, but I assume it's probably about the same. 123 consecutive years without fail. So that means, what does that mean? Well, okay, so the insurance company has to be profitable in order to pay a dividend. And if they've been paying dividends, Patrick, for 123 consecutive years, and a lot of them more, even 180 plus years, that means 123 years ago, that was the year 1900. And I want you to think, of everything that has happened in the, okay, uh, since 1900 in the United States, right? We've went through a lot of recessions. We went through the Great Depression, right, of the 1930s. So even during that time, insurance companies were profitable and they were paying dividends. So, but let's just say all that stops today. Let's just say that the insurance company is no longer going to pay dividends anymore, it's okay because inside of your policy contract, 
you have a guaranteed growth rate that is happening inside of your policy. So even if the dividends stop, you still have that guaranteed growth rate, which that's not going to happen in our lifetime, our kids' lifetime, our grandkids' lifetime. That's not going to happen because it's never happened in 120 plus consecutive years. But if it did, you still have a guaranteed growth rate. And keep in mind that every year, the insurance company, they declare their dividend. Every single year, the insurance company declares the dividend. And once the dividend is declared, it can never be retracted. It can never be taken back. So once it's declared and distributed, it is yours no matter what happens going forward. Okay. So you said a lot and that's cool. I've got some questions. Now, yeah. we were talking about before we you know, went live or went on to this particular podcast, we we're talking about writing a book. Let's pretend you're writing a book called Insurance for Dummies. The money, the money, the money multiplier for dummies. I'll, I'll I'm going to be the dummy. So we talk about this whole life policy. So you know we talk about borrowing against that whole life policy. Now, are you borrowing? First off, am I writing a check for twenty five grand, fifty grand, a hundred grand to put in against that whole life policy, or am I letting it build up over time and then whatever that pot? turns out to be. Let's just say at some point it's 50 grand. Whether I write the check or I build it to 50 grand, that may take longer. What am I what am am I able to borrow 50? Am I able to borrow 100? What can I borrow against that 50? Yeah, great question. And 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 anyway, just like as far as that book, the um like insurance for dummies, I actually wrote a book called Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery. I just didn't <laughs> name it Insurance for Dummies, but I mean, I could have. You could have. <laughs> very simple, right? Um, so, yeah. So, anyway, this book. And also, I'll offer your listeners. All they got to do is send me an email, brent at themoneymultiplier.com, and I'll send everybody, you know, just just uh, that ebook that I wrote. Now, yeah. uh, as far as to answer your question... The answer is yes, and it depends. It can be all of the ways that, uh, as far as how you phrase the question. So, okay, but typically here's what happens. And if it's okay, I'm just going to use $10,000 because that's an even number. Sure. And I can add that up in my head pretty quick. So typically, if a person puts in $10,000 of premium into their whole life policy, they're going to have cash value immediately. And again, immediately is within 30 days. So you mm -hmm. can start using the cash value immediately. Now, there's some people that will put money in and they'll let it build up and then they'll go buy something. I'm all about using the money immediately. So, for example, let's say you put $10,000 into the policy. Typically, what's going to happen is you're going to be able to borrow anywhere between 55 and about 88 percent of that money immediately. And you're thinking, well, why the difference? Why 55 and 88? Well, mm. it depends on how your policy is designed. For example, we have clients that are really looking at the long term growth of this and not the immediate short term. If that's the case, then we're going to design the policy where you're on, uh, okay, just the lower end of the borrowing power, 55 to 60%. But if you mm. need to put money into the policy right away, then yeah, you can get about 88% of that money can come back to you right away. But now in order to do that, what you're doing is you're killing a little bit of the long-term growth. It's not necessarily bad. It's just different. You have people in different scenarios. So the way we design the policy is based on the client's needs and what they're about to do with the policy and also their need for finances immediately. And I know what you're thinking, that you're thinking, well, everybody needs finances immediately. So, I, OK, so I did a call earlier this morning with a guy that has like a forty three million dollar net worth. He does not need money immediately unless he's buying something for more than 43 million so his concept his is more just going to be as far as the long-term growth i do another call that and i talk to a client that is basically they live paycheck 
to paycheck. Well, that person has a high need for that as much money as they possibly can get. So again, okay, the thing is, Patrick, people can start at different areas. There's going to be mm. different scenarios of exactly where they go. But keep in mind, no matter where you start and what design that you do, and again, so that's our team, we'll go over a strategy call with you to customize your policy to your needs based on what's going on in your financial life. But no matter where you start, the growth continues to increase. Every day is better than the day before. Today is better than yesterday. Tomorrow is better than today. That's not me telling you that is inside the policy contract. So for example, the first year, let's say you put in a dollar and you're able to use 60 cents of that dollar. Now keep in mind, the whole dollar is yours. It's just that the whole dollar is not the whole dollar is not able to be used immediately. OK, now the second year you put in a dollar and now you can use, say, 72 cents of that dollar. By the time you get to the third year, you put in a dollar, you're able to use a full dollar. And every year after that, every time you put in a dollar, you're able to use more. And I'll give you my real life example. I have 28 of these policies. I start at, uh, um, anyway, so I start a policy at least once a year or every other year. So the most efficient policy I have is my oldest policy. That wasn't the highest premium policy I pay, but it's my most efficient because of age. So that policy I started a, about actually a little over 15 years ago now. I started that policy in February of 2008. So this past Fabu this past February Patrick, every dollar that I put into that policy, I was able to use $2.57. So that means if I put in 100,000, I could use $257,000. But it all depends how much did I start the policy with, right? So that mm -hmm. dictates how much you're able to continue to put in. If you put in a very small amount, that means as you continue each year, the thing you have to do is keep putting in that small amount. And that's why people start additional policies because the thing that happens is their net worth just tends to increase as they age or as they tend to use this concept and pay for their debt and expenses and recapture and recycle the money. So they start additional policies. So each and every year, the policy gets more efficient. So even though I could use like $2.57 this year on that policy, so now next year when I put in the, a dollar, it's even going to be a higher percentage because that's the way it works. And that is, and okay, all those numbers I'm sharing with you are inside of your policy contract. So before you ever sign, pay, and accept your policy, you will see all of those numbers and how it works. So to go back to your question, how do we make this simple for, right? As far as for, like you said, a book for dummies, all we're doing is adding one step in your financial life. Instead of me taking money and taking it down to the conventional bank of Florida and putting money in that bank, I'm going to put the money into the policy. And now from the policy, I'm going to use that money to do everything that I'm doing in life. So it's not a complicated system, although it can become complicated if we try to just to think of a, a thousand scenarios. But it's as simple as paying yourself first, putting money into the policy and then from the policy using the money. So there's a couple of other things around this. So that's great, by the way. I love the explanation. You're very clear. So I like it. So there's some, you know, I, I'm also looking at application. You, know, you talked about your uh, client with a net worth of 46 million. He's in, he's putting it into that policy for a totally different reason for future state, future date. You've got an older policy that, you know, now let's conceivably has a couple hundred grand in it you now then have the ability to leverage that and borrow more. So I see in terms of 
you know, future state. So in other words, you know, when you look, it could be a, or it could be an emergency fund. It could be yeah. something that, you know, you plan for the future, don't really need the money, but I've, when it, I'm going to take it when I need it. And it's kind of an emergency fund, but there's, so I see a couple of different applications for it. Uh, so I like the concept and, and the idea of that. There is that, you mentioned it briefly around insurability. So I see this as a young man's game as opposed to, let's say, a 60-year-old game. Is is that an accurate statement? And the question that I have for you is around insurability. Yeah. Now, there was a time where, as you pointed out, I, like what I'm hearing in this is this a younger person's game than an older person's game, better at 25 or 35 than it is at 60. So that's the first part of it. Then insurance insurability comes into play in terms of your health. But there's another aspect of that. And I get all that, by the way, because I've gone for insurance and had to go through all the medicals and blood tests and all the rest of it. Now, the next phase of this is, is it clear? Like if I get a whole life policy that you're talking about when I'm 30, I'm healthy, I'm cool. I've got that policy. Then the insurability doesn't ever change. Like in other words, they have to insure me as long as I'm paying my premiums and moving forward. Is that still a case? Yeah. So, so like a couple things there to unpack. And thank you for that question. I mean, that's it. it, it it's extremely important what you're asking. Um, so, so let's go back to what you said as far as as far as being able to use the money now, or if you want to use it like in the future. So back when I first started this concept and I told my wife, hey, honey, I'm going to put money into an infinite banking policy. She kind of looked at me like, we're going to do what? Because we have all this debt. At that time, we had all this debt. As a matter of fact, I was $984,711 in debt. That's what I <laughs> owed to the third party creditors. And because of this concept, I was able to pay it off in 39 months, three years and three months. So back then when I came to her and I said, honey, we're going to put money into a whole life policy. Now, I got to tell you something about my wife. OK, the one thing about my wife is she does not believe in divorce whatsoever. But when I came to her and I told her this, we were close to going to the attorney's office to discuss divorce because we were on. Totally different platforms on this. And then another thing about my wife is I definitely married up, which I've already mentioned that a couple times. So anyway, so my wife is a nuclear engineer by trade. She's got a master's degree in nuclear engineering. She actually um, she helped design the new the nuclear reactor for the submarines <laughs> that the U.S. Navy has. Right. So she's got every I dotted every T cross. But here's how she looked at it. Exactly what you said earlier. She looked at it like, okay, I have my, okay. Like I have my husband, Brent, he likes to spend money because I like my toys. I like boats and wave runners and airplanes and motorcycles and all of that. So this was a way in her mind that it was going to make me save money. It was like forced savings. So now what I've got to do is I've got to put this money in the policy and it's forcing me to save, right? So that's how she looked at it. And that's how she kind of came on board. And now fast forward, all the stuff that we know now, this is exactly where we keep any savings. We keep it inside of the policy because Patrick, if you think about it, um, okay, again, so the only difference between a conventional bank and an insurance company is the name on the door, right? Because they are both depositories. They're both places for you to store your wealth. So if you have a choice of where that you want your wealth to reside, would you rather have it reside in the conventional bank of Texas, Florida, California, Canada? Or would you rather have it inside of your own banking system I your whole life policy in the mutual company that pays dividends. As a matter of fact, the guy I was telling you about that, that's my mentor that wrote the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. He also wrote a book called Building Your Warehouse of Wealth. Also, he wrote that book and he goes in and talks about where do you want your warehouse of wealth to build? So I had to kind of go over that because you mentioned savings account, right? So Let's go to your question about this is a young man's game. No, here's why. And I get, 
I get just the reason that you and the viewers may be thinking that because I thought that way too, because here's what you're thinking. You're thinking life insurance and the older I am, the more expensive life insurance is. So we have to do this as a young man because it's cheaper. Remember what I said earlier. I never ask you how much death benefit that you want. I ask you how much cash do you want to put into the policy? And the amount of cash that you put in the policy is going to buy you X amount of death benefit based on your age and your health. So let's just say we had three people, age, we'll say age 30, 50, and 70, and they're all in equal health. And they all walk into the same life insurance store today, and they're each going to say, let's put $10,000 into their policy. Well, who's going to have the most death benefit? The youngest person. Who's going to have the least death benefit? The oldest person. That just makes sense, right? But you take those same three people and they each have a $20 bill. They walk into the same grocery store at the same time. Who's going to be able to buy the most groceries with the $20? All the same. Because it doesn't matter about your age, your health, the language you speak, the country you're from, the color of your skin, how good you look, how bad you're dressed. The same $20 buys the same amount of groceries. So age, Patrick, age does not affect the cash value. It only affects the death benefit. And remember, I'm here to solve your need for finance and cash. And if we do that, you'll have more death benefit than you can ever imagine. So hope that makes sense. Now, part two of your question was, okay, what about health? You are right. You have to qualify in order to have the policy on your body. In other words, you got to pee in a cup, give some blood. The insurance company has to make sure you look as good on the inside as you do on the outside. So if you told me, or if anybody said, hey, Brent, I've got cancer, or I just had seven feet of my intestines removed, or I just had a kidney taken out, then yes, you are probably not going to be insurable. If you're a diabetic with an A1C level above a seven, you, you, you may not be insurable, right? However, that doesn't mean you cannot practice this concept in your own life and own policies. All you do is you own policies on other individuals, mm -hmm. the spouse, children, grandchildren, anybody that you have a vested interest in as far as like a partner in a business. You own and control the policy, okay? The owner controls all aspects of that policy. So the only difference is, is that you yourself are not insurable. I had a a colleague of mine, and he passed away about a year ago. And actually, he was diagnosed with leukemia. And I think it was back in 2006. And they gave him 90 days to live. Okay. Well, all these years had passed until about a year ago. And he had less leukemia cells in his body than somebody that's not diagnosed with leukemia. But because he had that diagnosis, Patrick, he could never get a policy. And I remember him telling me quite often, he said, yeah, I can't get a damn policy I, I, because I was diagnosed with this leukemia, but I don't have any leukemia in my body. It's gone when I get tested. And, he, and, and I remember him saying this more than once. He says, I don't know what's going to kill me, but it's not going to be leukemia. So I think it was in March of this year, he was in Hawaii. He, he came out of a grocery store. He tripped and fell onto an oncoming car, and the car hit him and killed him. Sad, sad thing, right? Mm -hmm. Leukemia did not kill him, but he owned 108 policies, right? Like, and again, it's probably been a couple of years since I talked to him before his passing, but he owned 108 insurance policies, but he never owned a policy on his own body after that leukemia diagnosis. So the point being is, is even if you're not insurable, you can insure other bodies and other people. Now, to go back to the age thing, um, I think the oldest individual 
that has ever been insured by us at the money multiplier is age 76. So if you get to be above 76, let's say I'm okay. Let's say like today you have a listener that's 80 years old and he's thinking, Oh man, I'm 80. I wish I would have done that back when I could have. Well, you're right at age 80, no matter how good your health is, you're not going to get a policy on your body. But you can own policies on other people, family members, people that you have a vested interest in. So the question I have is, I know many in this community who, let's say, have a whole life or an existing policy. So qualification is not necessary. But what you said early on was that this is structured. This is a very specific policy. Is it then possible to take an existing policy and re- yeah. frame it or move it to this upgrade it sideways downgrade whatever terminology that they would use are we able to then enter into this conversation yes i apologize i didn't ask or anyway i didn't answer that part of your question before your question that you asked before was um was um um just just about the policy see now i lost my train of, of thought um just about a policy oh okay just about the age of a person and if their health changes. Yes, this is a whole life policy. So once that policy is issued, it is issued. It doesn't matter what happens with age or what happens if your health deteriorates, mm -hmm. that policy is in force. It can never be taken away from you. Now, mm -hmm. to get to your question about if people have, say, as far as another kind of policy, right? Um, or, okay, probably just a lot of your listeners already have a whole life policy mm -hmm. and they're thinking, okay, well, can I use this policy to do the banking concept? And the answer is maybe it depends. It depends on how that policy was designed. So part of a service that we offer is that any type of cash value policy that you have, we will review that policy and tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly, and how that can be used. Now, let me say this. If it is a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends, even if it was not designed specifically for cash value, if that policy has age on it, it's probably a good policy. Most likely, it is a good policy. As a matter of fact, we see people like that all the time that bring us their policies, and they say, Brent, Tell us what we have here. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, Patrick, you have the Corvette sitting in the garage, but you haven't been able to find <laughs> the key. Right now we found the key. So now we're going to start using this policy. So many people have these OK policies already and they don't even know what they have. Now, if it's a brand new policy, then it may not be as efficient because it's brand new and it may have no cash value if it's brand new if it's a whole life because the way the agent designs the policy they don't design it to where you get the immediate cash value and and you're thinking well why wouldn't the agent do that because if he designs it okay the way i design it he has to take a 60 to a 90 percent cut in his commission six mm. zero to nine zero and they're not willing to do it that's why most insurance producers will not talk to you about this concept because they're not willing to take that hit in their commission. Now, so let's explain another type of policy. Um, right so here. before you go on, Brent, I want to just, just yeah. insert a question there. Now, this particular policy we keep referring to as a whole life policy. But to your point, people have whole life policies. Now, is there a specific name like whole life forward slash lend against or is there like a is there a, another name for this particular policy well no there's not another name for it it's a whole life policy in a mutual company that pays dividends but okay. the thing that i would ask okay whoever you go get that policy from you want to see how much cash value is available immediately and you also want it structured to where you have the capability, if you choose, to always, always, always pay the policy premium. 
all the way up into age 100 or age 121. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that, mm -hmm. but you want to have the ability to be able to do that. And you want to have immediate cash value and anything below, say, 55 percent of immediate cash value with an increasing scale year after year is not acceptable. It's not acceptable and don't accept it. And again, here at the Money Multiplier, we'll review the, you, those. It's such a great conversation. And I'm trying to give listeners as much meat on the bone as we can here, Brent. So I'm no insurance expert other than I've got some life experience in the space of whole life versus term and so on and so forth. But as I recall in previous conversations, you have a what you're talking about is the cash value of a whole life policy. But most are not focused on the cash value. They're focused on the life value in terms of what happens on my demise. Does my wife get the money? Do my kids get the money? Does my estate get the money? So they're focused on that part of it, not the cash flow is, or not the cash flow, not the cash value. Is that an accurate statement? What I'm just Yeah, that is an accurate statement. And and just anyway, those people buy what we call term policies where there where, where there's no cash value, but it gives you a death benefit for a low price. Now hmm. the problem with the term policy is it's like you're renting insurance. As a matter of yeah. fact, now I'm not saying people don't need term insurance at all. That's sure. not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it's it is very very unlikely as a matter of fact less than 2% possibility that your term policy will ever pay out because that's how many pay out is less than 2% because if the insurance company thought that you were going to die during that term they would never issue you the policy and the problem is is if you live which you will most likely live um as far as beyond that term, the next time you go to get a term policy, it's so super expensive. You're like, well, I'm not going to do it. And you don't mm. do it. And most people pass away with no life insurance. Isn't that crazy, Patrick? Yeah. Most people pass away with no life insurance. The one thing that is guaranteed in life, you're going to die, pass or graduate. It's not if it's a when. <laughs> and most people do not insure for that. But but the, but so the thing that people will do is they'll insure their car, they'll insure their house for 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 theft, fire, damage, vandalism, and what chances are they're never even going to use those policies. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent. So uh, when we look at the, the the insurance industry overall and the whole life and life and term, I mean. It's, it's confusing to say the very least it so is. In, in my experience, you know, then you got whole life and term mixes. You've got all sorts of combinations of things, but IULs, VULs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. And, and so that's why I'm finding this conversation quite interesting. And I'm sure my listeners are as well going, Hmm, because most are driven to invest and to leverage and to understand creating that financial future and you know, we talked earlier about real estate and that you actually are a real estate investor. You've owned lots of real estate in your career and in your history. Where does that fit in? So where does something like this fit into the conversation of creating that financial future and in alignment with a real estate portfolio, for example? Yeah, no, great question. And yeah, so like probably at this point, a lot of your listeners are thinking, well, Brent, what about an IUL policy, an index universal life? No, no, no. Double no, triple no, quadruple no. <laughs> okay, so we're clear and, on no. <laughs> and and to, in this book, Becoming Your Own Banker, Nelson goes in to why not an IUL policy for cash value. And we have several different content and like videos that I'm happy to send the listeners about Beautiful. whole life, versus IUL. So here's the problem with IUL. IUL is an investment, okay? Whole life is not an investment. People think of whole life as an investment because the cash value goes up. Well, the definition of an investment is something that can go up and can go down. A whole life policy can never go down. In an IUL policy, you can lose every single dollar that you put into the policy because as you age, the cost of insurance cannot 
keep up with the policy. I, I don't care. I don't care who you're working with with an IUL policy. Have them show you an illustration that you cannot lose every dollar. It's not out there. It doesn't exist. And if you don't believe me, get me on the phone with your IUL guy and we'll have a debate. Not a debate. We'll have a discussion and then we'll go through it and stuff. Okay. So IUL, not for this concept, not for cash value. If a person wants to invest in an IUL, it's a risk then yeah, put your money. Actually, here's what I say. I say, go get a whole life policy, borrow from the whole life policy and invest in an IUL, right? Mm. Just like real estate. Let's get to your real estate part of the question. Yes, yes, yes. I, I have invested in a lot of properties, short-term rentals, long-term rentals, Airbnb, VRBO. Okay. I'm getting older now, right? So like I'm age 56 so I'm getting tired of the rental game. And I'm not really tired of the rental game. I'm just tired of all the headaches that come with investment properties. You know, because I have to manage property, even though, yeah, I have property managers, but the property managers need to be managed, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, as a matter of fact, I have an older son, him and his wife are property managers in Captiva Island, Florida. I love them to death. You know, they're my family. But even my own children are a pain in the ass to manage them <laughs> and their property managers, right? Sure. So now the thing I like to do is I like to lend money. So what I'm doing, as, all right, so as we discussed earlier, I am selling off almost all of my rental portfolio and I am lending money. And, the, and so the way I lend money is I lend money with real estate as collateral. Now, I like first position because if you're not second, I'm sorry, because if you're not first, you're last, right? Mm -hmm. So I like first position real estate where I own the mortgage. And let me just give you an example of a loan I did last month. There was a guy in Buffalo, New York, and he was buying a $1.5 million house and it appraised at 1.7. So he needed $1 million. He was bringing $500,000 to the table. So I loaned him, okay, I loaned him the $1 million and he's paying me 16% interest, interest only. So wow. that's $13,300 and some change every month in interest. Now you're thinking, why would somebody borrow money at 16%? There are tons of people out there that are willing to borrow your money and pay those percentages. It's There's a ton of people. I'll turn you on to as many as you want. As a matter of fact, just to be totally transparent, as we sit here just today, which I don't know if we're allowed to say what date it is, but it's Halloween, right? Mm -hmm. On uh, It's actually Halloween. I have $8.9 million loaned out in 24 deals. 24 deals, most of that money, is interest only payments that are coming in. The majority of that money is between 14 and 16%. I have some 12s and 11s in there that are older loans, but anything that I'm doing today is no less than 14%. And, and if a person comes to me and wants to borrow less than 14%, I, I say, I'm not interested because there's too many people out there that will borrow your money. And why do they do it? Because a couple reasons. Number one, all right, so they can't show the income to carry the loan from a conventional bank. And number two, people don't want to go through the proctology exam of getting approved from the conventional bank to get the loan. So there's lots and lots of borrowers out there. So here's what I do, Patrick. I take my money. I, I All right. I uh, OK, so like I take the money. It goes into the policy first. From the policy, I now take a policy loan. Remember, I'm not taking my money out. I'm taking it from the general fund. So all of my money, all of my million dollars is still growing at that guaranteed compounded growth rate plus dividends. I'm taking a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. How much do I pay for that policy loan? No more than 6%. Everybody that I work with as of today is less than 6%. Also, the money that I'm borrowing is at simple interest, not compounded interest. Big, big difference when you borrow at simple interest and not compound interest. So, for example, if I borrow a million bucks and I'm borrowing it at simple interest, let's call it 6%, I'll use the high number, that means I'm paying $60,000 
to keep that money out from borrowing mm-hmm. it from the insurance company. Okay, that's fine. I pay 60, but remember my million is still compounding, which I'm not even telling you what that is yet because it right so like it's at least 4% if not greater. So then I take the money, I take the million dollars, I loan it to um okay, so okay, so now I loan it to the borrower He's paying me 16%, which is $160,000 a year. So mm. I'm paying $60,000, but I get one sixty. I will pay sixty dollars all day long to get one sixty. dollars sure. And not only do I get the one sixty, dollars I'm also getting the growth inside of the policy. Yeah. So my money is working for me over and over. It's working for me multiple times you're still netting the almost 16 percent. you're netting yeah. anywhere from 12 Absolutely. to 14 for sure so that's that's a great system i love that now <clears throat> you've been very generous with your time and i and i don't want to wind this down too fast but i do uh this has been great by the way i love this kind of meat on the bone strategy tactics kind of stuff and so I want to go off on a bit on a tangent here because I want to find out a little about you. Yep. But one more time, let's. What is your website again? Where do we want people to go? Got it. Yep. The website is www.vthethemoneymultiplier.com. And yep. again, so like if if I let your listeners email me, I will email you the ebook mapping out the millionaire mystery that I wrote with Chris. Noggle. A lot of you guys may have heard of Chris Noggle before. If not, go to chrisnoggle.com. Chris had a TV show on HGTV called Risky Builders. Mm, Cool, fun. So the reason I want to go off on a tangent is because you came uh, into this from an interesting background. You used to be a chiropractor. Yeah, absolutely. How do you go from chiropractor to this gig and this business model. Why, why was that? Yeah, good. And I guess I should have probably started with this as my introduction, but that's all right, man. We're going to, we'll, 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 we're going to we'll unpack this. Yeah. People we'll, are we'll still with in. us. Yeah. No, 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 all good. We'll back into it. So yeah, great question. So yes, I am a chiropractor. I still am a chiropractor, but I no longer practice chiropractic. Um, as a matter of fact, I own five clinics in the Kansas city area And so like, it's probably been since 2008, since I've actually practiced, I had associate docs that were in my clinics and I sold my last clinic in 2017. So here's what happened back in 2006. I heard this concept at a chiropractic conference and I heard somebody talking about this infinite banking concept, becoming your own banker. And I was like, man, that is really cool stuff but it seems too good to be true. There's got to be a catch. It seems too good to be true. So I got the information. I left that seminar in 06. I went home, went back to my normal life. I did nothing at all with the information. So I go back about two years later, um, about 2008, and about 10 or 12 of my chiropractic colleagues were at the seminar back in 06 with me. We're now at this seminar. But here's what happened. They were coming up to me. They were going on and on, ranting and raving about, oh, my gosh, Brent, isn't this banking concept the most powerful thing to pay off debt, to build wealth, to keep control of your money, all without working any harder, all without taking any additional risk, all without losing control, all with just adding one step in your financial life. So anyway, I had these colleagues throwing up all over me, and I was like, oh, my gosh, there's got to be something to this, right? There's no way that 10 or 12 of my colleagues are lying to me. Maybe one or two, but not 10 or 12. So I come home and I tell my wife, I said, honey, we have to start this concept in our life. And I've already told you how that conversation went, but I was determined that we had to do it. And at that time, it was February of 2008, I had $984,711 in debt. Now, how did I have that debt? I had my house that I lived in my student loans. I had a condo on the Lake of the Ozarks between St. Louis and Kansas City. And actually, that's where I'm coming to you from today. I flew up from Florida to my lake house yesterday. Um, And obviously, if you just have a house on the lake, you have to have a boat and a wave runner, right? Of course. Um, 
I'm also an airplane pilot. So as a pilot, I had to have my own airplane. Yeah. So it didn't take me a lot to become almost a million dollars in debt. Well, I was able to apply this concept and I was able to pay that debt off, Patrick, in 39 months, three years, three months. Didn't change my cash flow, didn't work any harder, take any additional risk or lose control of my money. I just added this one step. So I became really passionate about what was going on. And so the guy that I started my first policy with, I kept referring him business because this concept was amazing. And right. So, all right. So like every time that I would talk to somebody about it, I was like, you got to do this, man. You got to do it. Call my guy. Call my guy. Call my guy. Right. So anyway, I was over at my guy's office one day. His name is Ray. And um, actually, OK, so he walked downstairs. It's like a two story office that he had. He walked downstairs and he says to me, he says, Brent, I was looking through my records and I've seen that you've referred me a total of what, 41 new clients. <laughs> and I said, Ray, I said, you've never paid me a dime for any of those people. And I kind of laughed about it. And he says, no, no, no. In all seriousness, he says, you're very good at this. He says, you're telling people about it. He says, you should consider doing this in your life. I said, really? I could do this? I said, what do I got to do? He says, go get licensed and do this and do this and that. And that's what I did. So I got licensed in, in um, it was actually March of 2012. And I've been teaching this concept now. Um, it'll be, it'll be uh, what, 12 years in March. I eat, live, and breathe this concept. And I don't do anything different. I design your policy the same way I design mine. I don't put any secret sauce on it. I have multiple policies. I show you my policies, how I design them, what I do. So my daughter, her name is Hannah. Like if you go to our website, there's a podcast wherever you get your podcast from, go to the Money Multiplier Podcast. My 23-year-old daughter has like about 78 podcasts out there. She records one every week. So my daughter has multiple policies. This is how she's bought her house that she lives in, her car. She's actually, uh, she's got a new, a brand new Ford Bronco that's coming, the Heritage Edition. And <laughs> on the 28th of November, uh, okay, now again, so my daughter is single. All she has is cats. On the 28th of November, my daughter is closing on the penthouse condo in Daytona Beach Shores, Florida, that she's paying $954,000 for. She's doing that with the money from her policies, and she's going to recycle and recapture and get all the money back. November 28th, is the closing date. And I'm sure there's going to be many, many podcasts that she will be putting out of how she's doing the condo with pictures and all of that. It is a life changing event financially. <laughs> I mean, it will change your life and it has mine. And I'm very, very honored and grateful and blessed to have been able to share this with over 9,000 clients, 9,000 active clients over the period of those 12 years and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and 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 anyway i'll close with this before you ask me another question that patrick so the thing i love most about my job more than anything else is that nobody's ever mad at me people don't get mad at you when you're <laughs> helping them build keep and create wealth and if i do have someone that's mad at me they're keeping it a secret they have not told me I absolutely love it. I love your passion for it. And uh, it's hard not to get excited about it when listening to you. Uh, you break down what seems to be a very complex conversation, uh, eyes glaze over kind of conversation generally, and you make it really interesting. And, you know, let's put it this, you know, let's face it, it's financially viable. It helps you grow and move forward with wealth and uh, create more wealth. And it's always a conversation. That's what this podcast is all about. So I really appreciate your insights today. And people can reach out to you. We'll put all of the show notes in there. And of course, your links to your website and uh, even your friend and your associate in 
Alberta. So we'll make sure that people have all the notes that they need with that. But as we wind down, I'd like to find out a little bit more about my guest. And so we have some kind of fun rapid fire questions, put you on the spot a little bit. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. We're just going to warm you up a little bit. Apple or Android phone? Apple. You're an Apple guy. Okay, great. Do you have a favorite song or favorite, like a favorite tune or favorite band? Pour some sugar on me, Def Leppard. Wow, no kidding, eh? You're an old rocker. There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> favorite movie? Uh, Forrest Gump comes to my mind. Um, yeah. That's a good movie. Now, aside from the books that you've pointed out today, is there a book that it was also a fork in the road for you? Because it's interesting, the book that you shared uh, that your mentor, your 80 some year old mentor, you know, wrote, uh, that was a fork in the road moment for you as well, right? It certainly kind of took you down a path. Do you have a book that you, you know, refer people to or gift or recommend? Yeah. Well, yeah. So anyway, there are many, I like everything by Zig Ziglar, you know, yeah. The, um, yeah, the yeah. Zig Ziglar. Yeah, yeah. Legend. And, and and so the thing about Zig, he says, if you help enough other people get what you want, you end up getting what you want. But the other book I would say is um, a, a book called Who Not How by Benjamin Hardy. Yep. But um, it was written for Dan Sullivan. Yeah, Dan Sullivan, Benjamin Hardy. I'm a big fan of both of them. I, uh, one of the recent books, Gap in the Gain, is kind of become one of my most recommended books. I kind of try and live by that fundamental philosophy. It is a game changer if you do. At least I found it that way. Yeah. So if there's a God, what do you want him to say when you get to the gates? I want him to say, Brent, you have served a lot of people. And you, and again, I gave you two ears and one mouth. So what you should be doing is you should listen twice as much you, as you talk, although I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> and I just want to leave for people, I want to leave them a better life with the truths about money and how to keep control of their own money. And I want to pass along that to generation after generation after generation, because here's my thought process. The number one cause of death is heart disease, right? Mm. The number one cause of heart disease is stress. The number one cause of stress is money and financial issues. So mm. if I solve your, if I solve your financial problems and stress, it is going to make you a much healthier person, um, both mentally and physically. Love it. And finally, Brent, what are you grateful for? Oh, I'm just grateful for um, everybody that will al allow me to serve them and to listen to my message. And, um, it, 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 and, and, and again, just, just the support and the feedback, you know, and, and just the love that people give. Beautiful. And I, my friend, I'm grateful to have had this conversation with you today. I've learned a ton. You've opened up a whole new kind of, uh, I guess, path for me to go and investigate and look into. And uh, I appreciate that. I'm also very grateful always for my family, my listeners. And uh, I want to say thanks for joining me today on the Everyday Millionaire podcast. Thank you so much, Patrick. I appreciate you having me on. Hope we can do it again. Thanks you, again. You bet.